Welcome to Scripture Insights. I'm Taylor Halverson. Hey everybody, I'm Mike Harris. Today will be Enos, Jerem, Omni, and the Words of Mormon. So these are small little books in the Book of Mormon. Sometimes they're overlooked, but I think they're packed full of really interesting insights that help us understand God's work and how today he's still working with us to bring joy and salvation. So let's begin with uh, the name is the lesson. So the book of Enos, it turns out in Hebrew, the word Enos or Enosh means man. And what's significant about this is look at how Enos begins his record. Behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, or man, knowing my father that he was a just Enos or man. There's a little wordplay going on there. And he had been, I've been taught in his language, also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and blessed be the name of my God for it. So he says, he tells us about the wrestle, which I had, verse 2, before God, before I received a remission of my sins. Now, let's look at the word remission. In our church, we often talk about going on a mission. A mission means you go away. Now, let's think, in my word, we send out a lot of missionaries. When we send out a missionary, they leave. And when you say remission, it's an intensifier. A remission of sins means you have sent sins away. And what I'm talking about missionaries is that to help you understand that the word itself means about being sent away. And the re means an intensifier. It's intensively being sent away. That's what he's asking for. I want my sins out of my life. But notice once and for all. So the re isn't expressing, that prefix isn't expressing uh, doing it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can mean that in some cases, the re in Latin can mean again, but it also could be an intensifier of like, this really has been just finished off. But notice how he talks about the wrestle, which I had before God. It turns out if you look at the footnotes 2a, it references Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And what happens in Genesis 32? Jacob, well, that's interesting. The patriarch Jacob, remember you had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name gets turned into Israel, the house of Israel, the house of Jacob. Jacob, what does he do? He wrestles with a man. And there's a literary interplay with Enos, whose own father is named Jacob. And Enos is thinking about how his ancient, ancient forefather, the patriarch Jacob, also wrestled with a man who ended up being God. In fact, when Jacob, the patriarch, wrestled with God in Genesis 32, God then changes Jacob's name to Israel, which means God will prevail. That's interesting. That's beautiful. So there's all these really subtle but powerful literary interconnections that Enos, who is now a man, trying to become like a man like God, is having his own wrestle to also become like patriarch Jacob, to receive covenantal blessings that should benefit everybody. That's what we're going to see in this text. That Enos wants blessings for everybody and God covenants to offer those to everybody. Now, he talks about he's going out hunting. And he's out there thinking about the joy of the saints. Uh, that idea sunk deep into my heart. I kind of love that hunting language. When you're out hunting for animals, you want to sink an arrow deep into the heart of that animal. And Enos realizes the animal that needs to be hunted in this moment is his own fallen nature. And notice, when you go hunting in, in the ancient times, it's like, you're hungry. What does he say? What is my body? My soul hungered. And he kneels down before his maker. And look at the effort he puts into. Mighty prayer, supplication all the day. This is in verse 4. Night comes, I still do raise my voice. And then this powerful verse. And there came a voice unto me saying, Enos. Now I want to indicate this again. What does the word Enos mean? It means man. You might even compare it to the word Adam. And Adam was a generic description of any human. So you might see the word Enos here of meaning any human. That even though this is spoken directly and specifically Enos, the son of Jacob, you can put your own name in here. That you are a human. That God will say to you, if you also wrestle for forgiveness, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. And the word forgiven literally means to be 
thoroughly and intensively given away. It's related to the word remission. God. And then Enos wants to know, how is this possible? Yeah. What, what have I done to yeah. make this And then, before we get to that, we got to hit verse 6. His guilt is swept away. I remember once I asked my stake president, how many worthy temple recommend holders still feel guilty for past sins? And he thought about it for a half a second. Immediately he took, Mike, they all do. Mm-hmm. And I remember when he said that, I'm like, this felt, ugh. I just don't know if that's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where are we really supposed to go the next 40, 50, 60 years of our life, mm-hmm. beating ourselves up? Well, here, Enos's guilt is completely swept away, and he's just like, wow, I've been reborn. I feel this weight off. What was the secret? What did I do that... Me- and the Lord says to him, because you've been gone to church for f- three, four weeks in a row, you're not drinking too much Coke anymore, <laughs> and because you're reading your scriptures every day. No, no. Sometimes that's what we think, right? I- I've changed my behavior, and now I'm going to be forgiven. Him. But Elder Anderson teaches us in his book, The Divine Gift of Forgiveness, our repentance does not pay for one ounce of the sins that we've committed, right? Even if we never did another bad thing and we did all these wonderful things, that doesn't atone for any of our sins, right? What's the key? Keep reading here. The Lord says, because, verse 8, because of thy faith in Christ. That is, yes, of course, repentance requires a modification of our behavior. We need to cease doing that, which is evil. But it is Jesus Christ and our faith in him that removes the sin. In fact, repentance at the core of it is our relationship with Jesus Christ. I remember when President M. Russell Ballard, he came to a meeting where there were a bunch of bishops and stake presidents. And he says, anybody have any questions? One brother raised his hand and said, "How how can I know as a bishop if somebody's really repenting? And President Ballard says, that's the... That's the million dollar question that any bishop wants to know. And the only thing I know is to ask a certain question. When the person comes in to confess, after you hear them completely, then I would ask him this question. How do you feel about Jesus Christ? And then he says, bishops, you need to shut up. (laughs) You need to, I don't know if he said shut up, but you need to be quiet and let that person freely express how they feel about Jesus Christ. And while they're expressing their thoughts and feelings about Jesus Christ, you're praying as a bishop for the gift of discernment to see if what they're sharing about Jesus Christ, is it superficial or are you sensing that there's some depth there? And when you sense that there's some depth, then you know they're certainly on the path to repentance. That's all. That's beautiful. So twice in verse 8, God identifies that it was faith that unlocked for Enos the sweeping away of his guilt and the receiving of that glorious joy of forgiveness of if accepted God, our sins are gone. And notice what happens when we receive this divine gift of love. Notice the word desire. And it's paired with the word Nephites. Notice how in verse 9, Enos says, I began to feel a desire for the welfare of my brother and the Nephites. Now the word Nephi might mean good, lovely, desirable, or beautiful. So there might be a wordplay going here. When you have received the gift of salvation, when you feel that love from God, what you will also start to feel is the desire for other people to have that. And so it begins Mm -hmm. with those who he's most familiar with, the Nephites. And notice he says, I was thus struggling in spirit after having poured out his whole soul unto God for them, the Lord, the voice of the Lord came into my mind saying, I will visit thy brethren according to their diligence and keeping my commandments. And notice two more times in this verse what God says, I will, I will. So God is making promises. And what's interesting is the promises God makes to Enos here are no different than the promises God had already made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Adam and Eve, to Noah and his wife. God will always covenant with us 
to provide deliverance and salvation to other people if they also are willing to follow the path that's been laid out. Notice what happens in verse 11. After I, Enos, had heard these words, my faith began to be unshaken. He's just realizing that God is so good, so willing to help us. So now Enos starts praying, prayed unto God with many long struggles for my brother the Lamanites. Can I interject something? That's going to be hard, though, with your your enemies? Yes, and I want to quickly underscore, he's wrestled in prayer, and now he's struggling with prayer. I loved how Elder Holland once taught that there should be, yes, there are going to be times where we're going to pray and it's going to be pretty quick, but there's going to be other times where we need to have muscular prayer, mm. wrestle, strugglings. And then what are you going to say about, now he's praying, this is really amazing, he's praying for the Lamanites who love and delight to murder your own people? Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's a real challenge. And the people that I have known in my life who I would say remind me of Enos, who are so grounded in the love of God, that they also have expressed Christ-like love to people who we might claim would be their enemies. And any one of us could make a list today of personal or societal or national enemies. It's not hard. Humans, all in nature, find a list for enemies. That's not hard. What is really hard work, as we see Enos is doing, is how do we let God's love, the love of Jesus Christ, infuse us that, in verse 12 we see, that we will pray and labor with all diligence so that the Lord will say unto us about our enemies, I will grant unto thee according to thy desires because of thy faith. And what should we desire for everybody? Not just for those that we love in our own tribes or families, but even our enemies. Verse 13, this is what I desired. Remember the word desire probably means Nephi. Uh, I desired of him that if it should be so that my people, the Nephi, should fall into transgression and be destroyed, moving down the verse, that God would preserve a record of my people by the power of his holy arm and bring it forth into the Lamanites and bring unto them salvation. What? The people have been trying to destroy you. You want them to be saved? This is not how fallen nature humans act. Again, I invite any of us to look at what is being done in social media, the news. Do you see people typically talking like this in uplifting terms about people on the other side? Like, I really want them to succeed. No, it's about, I want to destroy them. They're, they're the worst. And using really nasty words about other people. And here Enos, who has been saved, realizes salvation is free. And if I really want to be like Jesus Christ, I offer it freely to others as well. So he goes on and, and he gets this beautiful testimony, and which is expressed here in verse 15. What is one of the key things that Enos learns? Middle of verse 15. Whatsoever thing ye shall ask in faith, believing that ye shall receive in the name of Christ, ye shall receive it. And I had faith, and I did cry unto God that he would preserve the records, and he covenanted with me that he would bring them forth under the Lamanites in his own due time. And I, Enos, knew it would be according to the covenant which he had made, wherefore my soul did rest. So again, the title page of the Book of Mormon tells us the purpose of the Book of Mormon is the witness of Jesus Christ and to bring to the knowledge of people the covenants of the fathers. And Enos was one of the many people who prayed for that to happen, and God covenanted to make that happen. So this chapter is just chock full of faith and the consequences of faith. And if you just even circled every time the word faith showed up, you'd find it all over this chapter. It's absolutely, uh, absolutely stunning and beautiful. So let's conclude the book of Enos. His last words to us, his clarion call of testimony. Come unto me, ye blessed, and speaking on behalf of Jesus, there is a place prepared for you in the mansions of my father. And I love that Enos, having had this transformative experience in his life, at the end of his life, he has this enduring testimony that he knows that he will come face to face with Jesus Christ and be welcomed into the mansions of the Father. And don't we all 
desire that. So we move into the book of Jerem, and you can see that the Lamanites and Nephites continue to have a lot of contention, and even the Nephites themselves are struggling with keeping the commandments, loving their neighbors, loving God. And Jerem, I can imagine he's got all these incredible records. And he says here in verse 2, he feels like he doesn't have a lot to say. He says, um, What could I write more than my fathers have written? For have not they revealed the plan of salvation? He is saying to you, Yea, and this suffices me. And he talks about in verse 3, um, Let's read this one as well. Behold, it's expedient that much should be done among this people because of the hardness of their hearts and the deafness of their ears and the blindness of their minds and the stiffness of their necks. Nevertheless, God is exceedingly merciful unto them. So even though the plan of salvation had been, re been revealed in full to the people, they still were struggling with just common Garden variety, everyday, fallen nature humans. And yet God will be merciful. And what's interesting is, Jerem talks about in verse 5 that the people still did try to keep the law of Moses, the Sabbath day, and be covenantly loyal to what had been revealed the law of Moses. And then we've talked about this in a past episode about what God expects of leaders and kings. That's Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and 20. That is basically God's commandments to kings and leaders. And what does he expect from Deuteronomy chapter 17? He says, kings should not seek after silver and gold, shouldn't seek multiple wives, should not take people into apostasy. Instead, the kings should have a copy of the scriptures and read it every day and teach it to the people and live it. And don't be lifted up in pride. What do we see in verse 7? He to pass that the Lamanites came many times against us, the Nephites, to battle. But our kings and our leaders were men mighty in the faith of the Lord, and they taught the people the ways of the Lord. So did they fulfill Deuteronomy 17 or break it? It seems like they fulfilled it. And what were the consequences when the people finally did listen to the prophetic word and they obeyed the commandments? Verse 8, they multiplied exceedingly. I wonder if that phrase doesn't just mean that they had a lot of kids. But I wonder if they're having some success with their missionary members. Right. There's this abundance that all things that are good and true, God will multiply for you. The gospel is spreading. Yeah. 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 And he goes on, verse 8, like all these things that they have had made their lives better. And then it goes on, and thus being prepared to meet the Lamanites, they did not prosper against us. But the word of the Lord was verified, which he spake unto our fathers, saying that, Inasmuch as you will keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. Now, the common understanding of prosperity in English today is like, I have material wealth. And it turns out that word, prosper, does include that meaning. And I don't think God takes delight in having people in paucity of poverty. I think God wants to, gives us the good things. But the word prosper is interesting because it literally means to look forward in hope. No, I like that. <clears throat> but it gets even better. If you look up the word prosper in the English King James Bible, it shows up in particular in Judges chapter 14, verse 19, where it says Samson was prospered in his conflict with the Philistines. But if you look at the underlying Hebrew word, the word prosper comes from the word the Spirit of God rushes down upon somebody. And so whatever you see prospering, yes, it does mean the good things in his life, but know that the underlying conceptual meaning that comes out of the Old Testament is the Spirit of God rushing down upon you. Well, let's think about sacrament. We promise to remember God at all times. What does he promise in return? That we will always have his Spirit, Spirit. to be with us, which means we can retranslate that to always prosper us. Let's think about the Nephites and Lamanites. One group was in covenant, one was out of covenant. One group had God's spirit to be with them, and he strengthened them against their enemies, like what we have here. They were able to overcome the Lamanites. The Lamanites were cursed. What does that mean? They did not prosper, meaning they did not have God's presence with them. And there may be some sense that because 
that they were not having God's presence. There also seems to be some kind of diseases that may have been some kind of skin disease they also experienced that created a sense of, of um, well, other people will say, well, you are filthy according to the law of Moses. And it's a signal that you are not welcome to the camp of Israel. You are not part of God's group. You can't be in his presence. So there's all these connections with the law of Moses and God's presence. So as you look at the word prosper, that when you are looking for God's prosperity, ultimately what we care about is having God's presence in our life, which is all about the whole purpose of the covenant, is being together with God. And ultimately, anciently, God's presence wasn't just merely filling the Holy Ghost, but it referred to finding his presence as found in his holy house. Yes. Yes. And so... Some people have mistaken these type of verses where it talks about the Nephites prospering and have gold and silver. Yes, generally, it seems to be true that those that keep the commandments, they tend to do well financially. Not all the time, but sometimes you see that. We've got to be careful not to fall for the mistaken notion of, what, what do they call it? The, the gospel of prosperity. That, that's a false notion. We know plenty of good, righteous, covenant-keeping people that have not been blessed with financial success. Uh, For example, Jesus Christ, Uh, Joseph Smith, Uh, Abinadi. So that's why that's why I love Taylor. What you're emphasizing here is when the Lord promises you that if you keep my commandments, you'll prosper. If I'm hearing you right, then I'm going to bless you with the Holy Spirit. And you'll be able to enjoy the blessings of my presence and all the blessings that I want to give you through my holy house. Mm -hmm. Is that a good summary? Yes. I would say that would be the first definition. And other things could follow. But the size of your bank account does not indicate your temple worthiness. So we move on to the book of Omni. And this record has multiple... uh, authors, and they're just each contributing a small amount to the record. At this point, it seems like the the small plates are getting more and more full. There's been so much great preaching that these other writers are like, well, I don't have a lot more to say. But there are a few couple highlights here, because they do lead us over decades, if not hundreds of years, down to the time of King Mosiah I, and then King Benjamin, which takes us into the large plates of Nephi, and the words of Mormon are the bridge into the book of Mosiah. But uh, I'd like to talk about how um, early on in the book of Omni, we get this phrase that at the end of chapter, or verse 4, the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed, for the Lord would not suffer uh, that the words should not be verified, which he spake in our fathers, saying that inasmuch as you will not keep my commandments, ye shall not prosper in the land. Meaning, Many of the Nephites had forgotten the Lord, had violated the covenantal security, and therefore they did not prosper. They did not have God's presence with them. And so the Lamanites came to battle. Remember, God is the Lord of hosts. Can you beat the Lord of the heavenly host? You can't. So the Lamanites could never win as long as God was with the Nephites. But if the Nephites walk away from God, they say, I don't want your presence. I don't want your prosperity. He's like, okay, good luck. You do you. Yeah, you fight on your own and see how that works out. And what we have Amron here is saying, well, they suffered the consequences of that choice. God honored their agency to be outside of his presence, not prosper, and therefore they were destroyed. Verse 12, I think, is really helpful to see the geography of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. It says here, there were some people of the Nephites that did stay true to the covenants. Notice here, behold, I will speak unto you somewhat concerning Mosiah, one of the good kings, right? Who was made king over the land of Zarahemla. For behold, he being warned of the Lord, he should flee out of the land of Nephi. For years and years, I'd read the Book of Mormon, especially when I got to the Alma War chapters. And it kept on talking about how the Lamanites lived in the land of Nephi. And I'm like, what? Why are they calling it the land of Nephi? Well, that's the key verse right there. The Nephites used to live there until they were driven out by the Lamanites. But the name, the land of Nephi stuck. 
Well, it's interesting if you turn back to 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 6. So there had been the land of the first inheritance where Nephi's brothers lived. And because of wickedness among Laman and Lemuel, Nephi was called by God to leave. So they leave with everybody who would follow, all the righteous. And they go to a new land and they call it the land of Nephi. And now hundreds of years later, the Lamanites have spread outside the land of inheritance. And they overtake the land of Nephi. And the Nephites had not been righteous enough to receive protection. And so the righteous had to flee. They come down to Zarahemla. And there they join with what we now know as the Mulekites, people who are descendants of, of uh, King Zedekiah. This is the people of Zarahemla. I like how you map that out. So let me make sure. So when they, the boat lands in the promised land, they first in a place they call the land of first inheritance. Mm-hmm. And then from there, they're commanded to leave, and they go to the land of Nephi. Mm-hmm. And then from there, the Nephites go to the land of Zarahemla. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so and then for the majority of the book of Mormon, you have the Lamanites living in the land of Nephi. And the land of the first inheritance. And the land of first inheritance. And the Nephites, in some ways, are <clears throat> refugees. Right? They are yeah. they, they are immigrants. They have immigrated into other people's territory. And the people of Zarahemla welcome in all these refugees and immigrants. And not only that, they let one of the Nephites become the king. Hmm. You already have a king. His name is Zarahemla. Why did... One king who already runs the land step aside. Step aside for people who, and they actually spoke different languages. And it turns out that Zarahemla recognized that uh, Mosiah was a man of God, had the records, had language, had education. And remember, a good king, what do we get from Deuteronomy chapter 17? A good king teaches people how to be loyal and faithful to God. And the people of Zarahemla had fallen into contention and fallen away. And yet, the king of Zerahemla realizes that we want to get people back to the Lord. We need a leader who has mastered teaching people the truth. And I know what the truth is, I can imagine Zerahemla saying, but I don't, I wasn't raised with it, but I will make sure that a good, righteous king is in power because I want to be a good king, so I will let another good king help me be a good leader. That was a smart move. Yeah. Now, it turns out... Um, this might be just a bit of speculation. We don't really know what every word in the Book of Mormon means from the original language, but the word Zarahemla might come from uh, the word Zarahemla, which means seed of compassion, merciful scattering, or the morning sun of compassion and mercy. Well, if it does mean merciful scattering, think about how these people of Zarahemla are Jewish people. Okay, they are from Mulek, the son of Zedekiah, one of the last Jewish kings. And they have been scattered, just like the Nephites had done. Now, the Nephites are from the tribe of Manasseh, Ephraim. Well, these people are from the tribe of Judah. And they're seeing that maybe perhaps God has provided a merciful scattering. Or maybe that bringing in the Nephites is a merciful scattering on our benefit to now get access to God's covenantal word. Before I read verse 13, let me just say one more thing about geography. Um, Everything we've been talking about, our salvation, is centered in Jesus Christ, not in geography. Now, God does save us in locations. He talks about being in a promised land, but the land itself is not what saves us. It's God. And if you might know, there's been some contention over the years about Book of Mormon geography. And I love how President Nelson and the other leaders of the church have urged us to focus on the key message of the Book of Mormon. And though it might be interesting to talk about where everything happened geographically, that is not the point of the text. And we definitely should not let that conversation be the dominant part of what we're talking about or lead to contention. Imagine God. He put us all this effort to preserve these words, and then we choose to contend about where the words Mm -hmm. happen. He's like, hold on. Why not be like Enos and know that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you can be saved? It's not about having faith in where it all happened. That has never been part of the plan of salvation, never part of the gospel expectation. It is not a temple recommend question. So let's just not have contention about it. So notice what we have here in verse 13, one of the key themes. It came to pass, uh, this is on my chapter 1, verse 13, came to pass 
that he did according as the Lord had commanded him. This is referring to Mosiah fleeing with the righteous people. Now there's this word here, Sariah, that we saw earlier on, that the word Sariah means the Lord commands. It may, it may mean that in Hebrew. And when the Lord commands, and if you act, the Lord provides. And in the Old Testament, when Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac, because the Lord commanded it, and eventually he was saved, both Abraham and Isaac, Abraham renames the place Jehovah Jireh, which means Jehovah will provide. So if you follow God's commands, he will provide. What does Nephi say? First Nephi 3, 7. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, Sariah, for I know the Lord prepares a way. What does Mosiah do? He obeys the commands of the Lord because he knows Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide Sariah. Lord commands Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. And any time that we respond to God's commands, he will provide a way for us to accomplish the thing which he has commanded us. That's kind of underlying essence of what's going on here in some of these verses. So again, I'm, I'm speculating here that with the word, the phrase that says the Lord had commanded, in Hebrew, that could be the name Sariah. And so I'm mm-hmm. tying it into some other passages we've had in the scriptures about where people talk about the Lord commanding and them acting and God preparing a way. Should we jump to the words of Mormon or any anything else we got to hit in um, Omni? Yeah, there is so much good stuff in Omni, uh, but... Maybe we'll, verse 26? Let's take a look at verse 26. How about the part right here where it says, uh, Yea, come unto him, come unto the Lord, Jesus Christ, and offer your whole souls as an offering unto him. I wonder if that, that the word offer and offering is usually the words used to describe what you do when you took your animal sacrifices to the tabernacle or to the temple to offer them unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. You say, just like you've been doing the law of Moses and doing all these animal sacrifices, you as well should be willing to Give your life completely to the Lord. Offer everything you have, your your wealth, your time, your talents. Offer it all to the Lord. And I can imagine how compelling and clear that would have been to the people at that time. Because they would have understood the difference or what, what this means. Like, you don't show up to the sacrifice and having, like, only brought just a small portion of the animal. Like, you'd bring the whole animal in. You wouldn't just chop off the hoof and say to the priest, oh. I am ready to go. I get the full benefit of the sacrifice because I got one part of the body, or one part of the uh, animal's body. Sometimes I hear people say, well, the, the temple covenants aren't in the Book of Mormon, and yet the Book of Mormon is supposed to have the fullness of the gospel. It sounds like to me they know something about the law of consecration. Yes. Isn't that interesting? It's a whole offering. And it's important to say that the Book of Mormon has a fullness of the doctrine of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we go to the temples, we get additional insight, guidance, perspective, uh, uh, viewpoints. And if you go to the temple, you shouldn't expect that suddenly it's a different gospel. It's not like there's gospel A for outside the temple and gospel B, there's some mm-hmm. different savior. Like it all works together. It's all part of the plan of salvation. And there are different covenants or promises we make along the way. But it's all basically the same thing, if you boil it down, is that God has promised to offer salvation, and we promise to be faithful and obedient in order to receive those things. Maybe this is a, a tangent, but I think it's an important tangent that, yes, the way the temple has been presented, the temple endowment has been presented, has been refined or changed over the years. But like Taylor's suggesting here, the covenants have always been the same. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law of sacrifice, law of obedience, law of chastity, law of the gospel, and the law of consecration. Adam and Eve knew about those covenants, those ordinances. That has always been a consistent part of the Lord's gospel. Before we step into the words of Mormon, I think it's important that we identify what may have led to some of the seeds of conflict among the Nephites after this merging of two people. Now, it doesn't really get mentioned here in the in the uh, the book of Omni, 
But we've already indicated, here's Zarahemla. It's a group of people. They already have their own society. And a bunch of immigrants show up who speak a different language, but they're all like second cousins, right? Because they all come out of Israel from hundreds of years before. But let's remember, in ancient Israel, Judah, through the line of David, was seen as the kingly tribe. So who has authority to rule? The tribe of Judah. Zerhemla is from the tribe of Judah. King Mosiah, when he shows up, what tribe is he from? Well, we hear in the Book of Mormon that the, the Nephi people, Le Lehi is from the tribe of Manasseh. That is not the kingly tribe. So what are some of the problems we see later in the Book of Mormon? There's always this fight about who's going to be the king. You get the kingmen who believe it's their right and privilege to be kings. You have the Amlicites, the Amalekites, and Amalekiah. In fact, the word Malek in, in Hebrew means king. Listen to this. Amalekites, Amlicites, Amalekiah, off to the kingship, and they're all fighting. Even the kingmen are all fighting to get kingship back in their own hands. And there is some possibility that people think that the people of Zarahemla, who are larger than this immigrant group of Nephites, who now are given, the Nephites are given the privilege of being the rulers and the kings, that the people of Zarahemla, who are the larger group, say, hold on, why do we have a non-group, non-Jewish group, who are not of the, the line of David, who is supposed to be, his line is supposed to be the only rulers, why are we letting these non-Jewish people be the rulers? That's a fair concern. And it may be that this merging of these two people planted the seeds of conflict that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Because possibly some people among the people of Zarahemla were unwilling to have anybody be a ruler unless it was from the tribe of Judah. So to restate, King Mosiah, King Benjamin, they would have not have come from the tribe of Judah, the Davidic right. lineage. So technically, according to the biblical perspective, they are not legitimate kings. But if you are from the tribe of Judah, and specifically you are from the Davidic line, and we know the Mulekites were from the Davidic line. In fact, even the word Mulek has the word king in it. It means little king. Yeah. And we can imagine that some people would be very angry and upset that immigrants have come in, and they're a minority group, and they're given the power to be kings, and yet we are of the line of David from the tribe of Judah, and we have to set aside. So if I'm, let's say I'm a Mulekite, and I see this merging of civilizations, what would help me navigate that? So I'd be like, you know what, even though this isn't the traditional pattern of having a non-king from, a king that's not from the tribe of Judah, what would help me see that actually this is the Lord's will that we break the tradition? Well, this is the small plates, Nephi's record, where Nephi is shown again and again to be chosen by God to be the ruler. And so if you believe the records and the traditions from the Nephites, then you're saying, well, this is God's will. But notice now you have two groups who... One group clearly is fighting against the Nephites. The Lamanites are like, well, we don't believe that tradition at all. Laman and Lamanites should have power. You might have some people, the Mulekites, who also say, I'm also not going to accept the Nephite records. And yet the Nephite records are the source of knowledge about the salvation. Remember, we hear in these, in these chapters here, the people of Zarahemla, their language had been corrupted. They denied their creator. They didn't even know about the gospel. So the Nephites are bringing salvation because of their records, because it's a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And yet, there's probably some people who are so angry and prideful, they're unwilling to let God's work happen. And I ask in our own day, do I ever make decisions about who's qualified to be in charge and who isn't? And like, well, they're in the wrong group, and so I will not allow them to be uplifted by God, to have decision-making authority. It's interesting how humans, we have so much pride, we often do not want uh, we, we often are not willing to let God do his work to have certain leaders guide us. It's kind of interesting. I love that. Okay, so the words of Mormon. Mormon explains what happens is that he has been doing this 
editing or abridging of the large plates. There's actually lots of records of the Nephites. And he's searching in the library. Now, this is hundreds and hundreds of years later, around 400, let's call it around 400 or 385 AD. And he discovers the small plates. And he's like, this is so beautiful, the deep, powerful witness of Jesus Christ. This is way better than simply listening to me edit all these records. He decides to insert unedited the entire small plates. So you have the large plates edited from Lehi down to King Mosiah. And then Mormon inserts the small plates, which basically repeats all that, but just the doctrinal side of things. And then he uses these words of Mormon to bridge and say, I'm picking up editing the story of the Nephites again, beginning with King Mosiah. And this is now my voice through the rest of the book except for the most, uh, for Ether and some portions of Mormon and Moroni. So as you read this chapter of Words of Mormon, that is a bridge. Mormon's trying to help us have, uh, understand what's going on in the record that we're now getting ready for uh, a new generation of rulers and Mormon's voice narrating that process. I can sense that Mormon is certainly a <clears throat> powerful witness of Jesus Christ. Like you said, he, he's living in the year 385 A.D. He's watching the genocide of his people being inflicted by the Lamanites. He's seen the Lamanites not just kill his people, but they're torturing them. They're feeding the flesh of the Nephite soldiers and giving it to their, their wives and their children. I mean, just mm -hmm. unspeakable atrocities. But yet... He, here Mormon is saying, look, look at verse 4. And the things which are upon these plates pleasing me because of the prophecies and the coming of Christ. And there's a verse here where to go. Oh, end of verse 2. There it is. I write somewhat concerning them and somewhat concerning Christ that perhaps someday it may profit them. The them referring to the Lamanites. Mm -hmm. In fact, he goes on. This is critically important because this is also referencing the purpose for the Book of Mormon ties into the title page. Look at the end of verse 6, and then we'll talk about 7 and 8. Um, he says, they are choice unto me, these writings, the small plates, and I know that they will be choice unto my brethren. So all these small plates we just... When he says my brother, who's that referring to? The Lamanites, right? And I do this for a wise purpose, meaning I'm inserting all these beautiful teachings and prophecies from Nephi all the way down to Omni, the book of Omni, because the, the Spirit whispereth to me according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore, he worketh in me to do according to his will, and my prayer to God is concerning my brethren. Wow. And if we go back to the title page of the Book of Mormon, <laughs> the title page tells us, and this you might call this a... Uh, uh, it was written by Moroni, who would have been familiar with his dad's words and testimony. The Book of Mormon is written uh, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast out forever. So that's all of us, and in particular for the Lamanites, and also to convincing the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God manifesting himself unto all nations. Again, it is absolutely clear this is a consistent theme and thesis throughout the Book of Mormon. We are writing this book to convince people of Jesus and especially for those that we have loved, but who are out, our family has been divided, we want them brought back in. We want them grafted back in. And I don't think, I hope none of our listeners have Lamanites like Mormon had in his life that are <clears throat> killing and torturing, but I think we've all been through some tough things where we have, to a smaller degree, Lamanites in our own lives. And we hurt because they've, of the decisions that, that they've made and that they continue to make. But again, what wonderful hope. Look at verse 8 again. And my prayer to God is concerning my brethren, these Lamanites, that they may once again come to the knowledge of God, yea, the redemption of Christ, that they, these Lamanites, these wayward, depraved, corrupt individuals, may once again be a delightsome people, which is made possible only through Jesus Christ. And that's what Mormon wants to highlight here. 
We hope you find joy and excitement as you engage in scripture study and that you can see that God has a plan, past, present, and future, and you are his child and he has a plan for you and your salvation.